Most of the music you probably listen to is recorded. Recording has played a very important role in the history of 20th century music. And in fact, the 20th century is punctuated quite clearly by significant developments in recording. But our story doesn't start in the 20th century. It starts in the 19th century with a man who was half a genius. I'm of course talking about E. Leon Scott, who invented the phonautograph. This was a device that recorded sound using a stylus onto discs of smoked paper. This was a rather remarkable invention. You played sound in, the stylus scratched a pattern onto smoked paper, and you had a recording of sound. Well, there was only one problem. You couldn't play it back. In E. Leon Scott's case, he was only capturing the movements of this particular needle. This invention would be refined by Thomas Edison, who would actually figure out a way to make the sound play back. And this is why we think of Edison as a genius and E. Leon Scott as only half a genius. In 1876, Edison makes his first sound recording on a phonograph. The principles behind the phonograph are actually pretty simple to understand. You must have seen pictures of these things. The big old giant record players with those big traffic cone looking things stuck on the front. Well, let me explain to you how that works. Sound comes in the front of the traffic cone, the big end, goes down to the small end, and across the open part of the sound end is a little diaphragm, a piece of material stretched tight. This material can be wax paper, it can be tin, anything that will vibrate when sound waves hit it. Attached to that diaphragm is a little spring, and attached to the end of that spring is a little needle, and that little needle is touching up against a wax cylinder. Sound waves come in, they hit the diaphragm, and they move the diaphragm. Remember, sound is vibrations in the air. So you basically have air moving in and bouncing up against this diaphragm. And as the air hits it, the diaphragm moves. And as the diaphragm moves, the spring that's attached to it moves. And the needle that's attached to the spring moves. And the needle digs a pattern into the wax cylinder as it turns. And this pattern is directly analogous to the movement of the diaphragm, which is it analogous to the movement of the air. And in that fashion, the vibrations in the air, the sound, are recorded to the wax cylinder. You can then reverse the process. If I take that needle and put it at the start of the wax cylinder and start turning the crank, the needle starts vibrating, the vibrations go up the spring and jiggle the diaphragm, the diaphragm moves the air, and sound comes out. It's that simple. Edison has big plans for his phonograph. He thinks, this is going to get used as a dictation machine. It's going to be great. Every office will have one, people will dictate letters, and then people can go back and listen to it later and type them up or write them up as they need to. Wax cylinders are kind of inherently limited, though. They're about the size of toilet paper rolls, and they're very fragile and hard to tote around, not to mention the fact that they're made out of wax. In 1887, a man named Emil Berliner creates disc recording using glass discs that are covered with paint. And he calls his invention the gramophone. He thinks it's going to get used in dolls and perhaps for recorded music. By 1897, the gramophone has matured. They now have a notion of a master disc, which means that instead of making a new disc for every copy of a piece that you'd want by having the orchestra playing over and over and over again, you'd make one and you'd stamp out a bunch of others with it. By this time, the discs are now made out of solid lacquer, only have one side, and have a standardized recording and playback speed of 78 rotations per minute, abbreviated as RPM. In 1898, a man named Valdemar Polson from Copenhagen demonstrates a magnetic recorder. What he calls the telegraphone records sound on piano wire. How does this work exactly? Well, you remember the principles of electromagnetism? All I have to have is a wire moving relative to a magnet, and I can generate an electrical current. Well, let's imagine that with my moving diaphragm, instead of connecting it to a spring connected to a needle that's directly cutting into something, maybe what I do is I take that spring, which is made of metal, and I make it move around the outside of a magnet. And then I connect the other end of that spring to some sort of other device. Well, what happens is, as the diaphragm moves, the wire coil moves around the magnet and generates an electrical signal, and that electrical signal can be transmitted someplace else. 
In fact, what you can do is you can transmit that electrical signal to another electromagnet and then write magnetism onto a piece of metal. And this is how the wire recorder worked. As the wire went in front of the tape head, the electrical signal fed a magnet that would then magnetize sections of the wire as it moved past the head. Pretty clever stuff. And you could then take this wire and roll it back past the head, and it would detect the magnetism, transfer it back into electricity, and then move it back up the chain to push the diaphragm again. And what is Polson's big idea for his invention? He thinks it'll be used for dictation. His tapes are able to record 30 minutes at a time, but the twisting of the wire introduces a rather unpleasant distortion, and the fidelity is just not good enough to use for pre-recorded music. In an effort to overcome these difficulties, he invents a version that works on steel tape, where instead of having a thin little wire, he's got a big tape that's actually made out of steel. Unfortunately, he has to move this past the heads very quickly. These tape reels are unwieldy, they're extraordinarily heavy, and if the tape breaks, God help you, you have a giant, loose, thin piece of metal whipping through the air. In 1906, there's another important technological development. A man named Lee DeForest invents the vacuum tube, which is probably the most important electronic development of the 20th century. It allows you to manipulate electricity. You can generate signals, you can modulate signals, you can amplify them, and you can detect them, all with this one invention that would later turn into the transistor and eventually a microchip. In 1912, Lee DeForest uses this vacuum tube to electrically amplify a record player. The modern tape recorder grew out of these early experiments in wire recording. In the 1930s, a German scientist began trying to come up with a better medium for recording than this lethal steel tape or this rather ineffective piano wire. He tries paper and plastic tapes coated with iron oxide or rust. He's basically taking a big piece of paper, making it sticky on one side, and then throwing a bunch of rust on it so he has something that's flexible so it can get wrapped up, but doesn't twist the way wire does. One of the big advantages for these machines is that the tape only cost 15 cents for a minute of recording time instead of the dollar a foot that steel tape cost. They were also much lighter. Naturally, Americans stuck with wire technology, thinking it was the best way to go, and they were completely shocked when at the end of World War II, they rolled into Germany and found out that the Germans were miles ahead of them in tape recorder technology. So they did what any winner of a war did. They took the technology for themselves. German recorders had perfectly accurate mid-range and could actually reproduce frequencies all the way up to 10 kilohertz, which was far beyond what the United States was capable of doing. The government takes this technology and says, we will make it available to anyone who wants it. All you have to do is fill out a few forms. Three main companies signed up to exploit this German tape recorder technology, one of which was named Ampex and was around for many, many decades after and produced the recording tape used in most major recording studios. Of course, this early tape needs a lot of improvement, and a company called the Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing Company, later known as 3M, starts working on developing the tape and finally gets something that's really usable, really stable by about 1948. In 1948, the transistor also appears, and in 1949, there are two exciting developments. One is, tape recorders now work in stereo. And what I mean by that is that it's possible to take this tape and print more than one track of information on it. You can print two tracks if you put two heads on one piece of tape. So as the tape moves by, you have one signal being written to the top part and one signal being written to the bottom part, all at the same time. The other important development in 1949 was the splicing block. See, this is one of the really important things about tape versus the discs that the phonograph used. Discs can't be edited. Once they're fixed and made, they're done. You can't cut them up and paste them back together again because the mechanical grooves they use skip. But with tape, I can take it and I can snip the ends and paste them back together and if I do it the right way using a splicing block you never hear that it's been done. Well think about all the possibilities that this now lets you have. It turns a tape recorder into a time machine and it lets you manipulate time. Now before you start thinking I've gone off the deep end let me explain what I'm talking about. 
As I'm talking, or as you're listening to music, it's passing by you in real time. There's nothing you can do to stop it or to capture it. Once you hear it, it's gone. It's of the moment. See, tape recording is measured in inches per second. You can select different tape speeds for different fidelity. But the idea is that if I have a piece that's three minutes long in real time, once I record it to tape, it becomes X amount of inches long. I can record myself talking now, capture this moment in time, and then five minutes or five days or five years, play it back and experience this moment in time again, experience this sound, this transitory thing. Even better, I can manipulate it. I can play that tape back twice as fast and make the music happen faster than it normally could. Or, I can take a piece of this music, clip it at both ends, tie the ends together and make a loop out of it, and make a piece of music that never, ever ends. I can take time and tie it in a loop. The most exciting thing about tape is this ability to edit, to change, and to manipulate sound. And this is why the tape recorder is one of the most important developments in music in the 20th century.